Earlier this year, I was drumming up new concepts for a video when an idea jumped out at me. What if I held a show not unlike the Oscars, where I broke down and reviewed a ton of Thomas fan content, giving recognition to one of the most passionate and creative fan bases on the internet? A group of people who, for their size, produce more content than any other fandom I'm aware of, and have kept alive a show that has long since lost its footing to the corporate overlords that own it. So, without any idea of how it would be received, I put together a quick trailer announcing the Steamy Awards, and linked a form for fans to submit their favorite creators. And it exploded. With over 250 submissions and over 9,000 views, I'm happy to say that you not only got the message out, but blew my expectations out of the water. And because of you, I was not only exposed to creators big and small, many of whom I've never even heard of, but actually got to talk to some of them in one form or another. And while this video will be showcasing who I think are the best of the best, I cannot overstate just how amazing this community of creators is. And regardless of who receives an award or not, I hope you come away from this video celebrating the incredible talent this fandom has to offer. Welcome to the Steamy Awards. But, before we get started, a few ground rules. First, like the real Oscars, I'll only be judging submissions that premiered in 2022. There are plenty of creators who haven't made any Thomas content recently, and I don't think it would be fair to talk about them when there are so many other people who are currently making amazing work. However, I do have something special in mind for those creators, and I'll be getting to that later in the video. In addition, when looking at an overall channel or series, I did take entries from previous years into consideration, but only if the channel posted a video for that series in 2022. So a channel's previous work still counts for something, as long as that piece of work has had a recent update. Second, while I'm putting an emphasis on the franchise we're all here to see, that doesn't mean I'll exclusively be looking at Thomas-related material. Variety is the spice of life, and who knows? You might just get introduced to something new through this video. Third, and I can't believe I have to say this, but if you or your favorite creator didn't make the cut, that is not a personal attack against anyone. I tried to look at each submission as objectively as I could, and though my own personal biases were a factor in the final decisions, they were by no means the only factor. Also, keep in mind that I started the process of sifting through submissions back in September, so anything that got made after August 31st wasn't on my radar to begin with. And finally, the most important rule of all, if a channel wins an award in any category, they are ineligible to win another award in a different category. This is in the interest of not only keeping the bigger creators from steamrolling the competition, but also to hopefully shed some light on the smaller creators, most of whom are just as talented. Those who do win will be contacted directly, and will be given the official steamy icon that they can put on their winning video or channel banner. And before you ask, yes, it's basically an NFT trophy. I would have loved to get something physical made and sent out to everybody, but I also enjoy eating, so sorry about that. Now then, with all that preamble out of the way, I say it's time we finally dive in. And there's no better place to start than with Best Original Story. This category was one of the first big challenges I came across while going through the submissions. Just about every piece of media has, at one point or another, inspired its fans to write their own stories based on that thing. 
However, no franchise has as wide a range as the options for Thomas and Friends. I got stories about Sodor's early years, the Season 7 characters, stories in the style of the CGI seasons, and others that just did their own thing entirely. It was honestly baffling to see the sheer number of original stories made in 2022 alone, many of which being leagues above even the official product. However, there were four that stood out to me in this first section. Those four being Lamp by Victor Tanzik, Sparknote by Carson's Video Workshop, Passage by Caleb Train, and finally, Alfie's unforgettable performance by Demon of Nowhere. So without further ado, let's give them a closer look, starting with Lamp by Victor Tanzik. As I started the process of going through the original story submissions, I knew I'd inevitably be dancing with an episode of the Stories of Sodor at some point. It's an incredible series with some stellar storytelling, and while Season 4 was easily some of the best of Victor's work so far, no episode quite matched up for me as well as Lamp did. There is so much stuff that happens in this episode. We learn about Stanley and Benson, two characters that haven't really been given a whole lot to do in the series up until this point. We get to see some really sweet interactions between Rosie and James, which is a ship I didn't even know I needed. And we get one of the best action sequences to come out of the series thus far, followed by a fantastic scene where the Fat Controller- <gasps> Where did you get this? What kind of a cruel joke is this? While a great moment on its own, this scene with Sir Topham Hatt is elevated by what I believe to be the best parts of this episode. It's beginning and ending, the first of which shows a scene of soldiers boarding a ship headed out of France, only to get caught up in a severe storm. And just as they try to send out an SO- Come morning, a passing cruiser finds the vessel torn to pieces, but upon further inspection, someone on board the ship spots a light flickering in the water. One soldier has survived the ordeal, clinging to both life and the lamp he used to signal a rescue. And in the latter of these flashbacks, this soldier is revealed to have been sent to a psychiatric hospital on Sodor, where the episode finally shows its hand in one last foreboding scene. Was there a problem? Yes, Dr. Anderson. We hit a rough patch of rail and one of the patients dropped something he was carrying. What was it? A lamp. He was the sole survivor of the Lady Rose. He used it to signal the rescue team and wouldn't let go of it afterwards. He became extremely upset after it went through the window. We had to sedate him. What's his name? It's a funny one. Hat. Lieutenant Topham Hat. That's him there. Thank you, Private. Don't worry, Lieutenant. We're going to take good care of you. What makes these two scenes amazing for me is how they tie perfectly into earlier pieces of history from the first two seasons, and how the dialogue between characters both is and isn't delivered. As we just saw, the final scene is as you'd expect from Victor Tanzik. The angles are there, the characters are talking, everything is how it should be. But in the first scene, there's nothing. Not a single word is spoken until we hit the opening credits. It perfectly sets up a mystery at the beginning of the episode, and using both past and present, pays it off by the end. When this last scene played and everything clicked together, it was one of the most satisfying things I've ever seen done in the realm of Thomas. Often creators that try to tell a complex story fall into one of two categories. Either they make the lore way too complex and vague, leaving the viewer wondering what the point of any given scene is, or they spoon feed each and every bit of the mystery to us so you can't possibly get lost. Both of these suck for vastly different reasons, but thankfully, Victor managed to walk the tightrope between showing and telling in a way that just works. As far as the story goes, the only thing I can point out as being kinda weak is the information about the Lucky Lamp being in the exact place it needed to be in order for Rosie to tell James, and by extension the viewer, what exactly we saw in that opening scene. I mean, the odds of that are, well, as James put it. That's not luck, that's absurdity! However, I'm going to let this pass because A, the lamp being established as military property means it has to have some sort of record to begin with. And B, because the lamp itself has had an established way of guiding things in the right direction before. It's kind of a running theme in the series. And it's never bothered me before, so why should it do so now? Now then, let's move on to the next entry, shall we? Sparknote by Carson's Video Workshop. Like with Victor Tanzik, I've taken a look at Carson and his crew before, 
And as I did with Victor, I had a very difficult time finding the right video to represent their channel. Express Permission is a long but fun story that never overstays its welcome. Spilled Milk has some great interactions between Daisy and Richard, and the Lazy Loco actually managed to build on a character from the Hit era of all things, which is something I thought most people had just given up on. But after some thinking, I eventually landed on Sparknote, written by DCG12B. This episode picks up with Percy and his mail train, telling us how much pride he takes in his work, and establishing an unseen component of the service known as the Newspaper Train. When Sir Topham Hatt decides that the Newspaper Train needs its own dedicated engine, he looks to an original character named Richard to do the job. This prompts an argument among the big engines, who think Percy is too small to handle the mail runs, and that the whole job should just be given to Richard. Of course, the little engine hears this exchange from a nearby siding, and becomes quite upset at the idea of his favorite job being taken away from him. Now, normally in stories like this, the focus character would let something like this go to their head, only to then be taken down a peg by the end of the episode. We see this trope used all the time in Thomas, especially in the later model and CGI seasons. Collect Trevor, take the Worldsworth track. I'm not going on that track. But this is where the choice character really shines. Richard isn't like Gordon or James. He's a big engine, sure, but he doesn't act like one. In his mind, he's just a regular guy, no more or less important than engines like Percy. And so, he tries to come up with a way to fix things. At first, he hopes to just talk to Percy and sort things out. But every time he arrives at the junction, the little green engine is nowhere to be found. Eventually, he decides to take matters into his own hands, and makes a plan to hold back on his first run with the newspaper train in hopes of making Percy look good by comparison. But as he waits to put his plan into action, some curious boys get up to a little trickery of their own, accidentally tightening the brakes on Richard's tender, unbeknownst to his driver and fireman. As they try to set off, Richard is held back by his tender, and struggles to drag the train out of the station. He works so hard, sparks begin to fly from his funnel. After a few moments, his crew realize what's going on, and quickly release the brakes. Problem solved, right? Not quite, as the sparks from Richard's funnel end up landing on one of his vans. Hey, what's he carrying again? Oh fuck. Richard charges down the line as the fire spreads from car to car, pulling into the station where Percy is waiting for them. The station master yells for Richard's crew to move him away before the fire spreads, but the train is too heavy for the big engine to pull away so suddenly. But as Richard struggles to move, Percy springs into action. Leaving his mail train behind, he buffers up to Richard and helps the burning train leave the station before it's too late. The episode ends with the two engines having a light-hearted, yet also heartfelt conversation, where Richard tells Percy what he wanted to say from the very start. Once again, another fine showing by the Video Workshop crew. I'm very impressed with DCG's writing for this one. He had two opportunities to write a bland, been-there-done-that story, and instead he threw me for a loop twice. I was expecting Richard to do something stupid to make himself late on purpose, and while that was his plan, the fact that his misstep with the train wasn't something neither he nor his crew could anticipate was great. Coupled with a genuinely exciting scene that wouldn't feel out of place in Season 5, and visuals that range from beautiful to mind-boggling, and you've got a great story. Seriously, that fire effect makes my brain melt whenever I come back to this story. I do a lot of video editing, and I have zero idea how they got that to work. It looks amazing, and I genuinely hope they try more effects like it in the future. Speaking of things that look amazing, next up is Passage by Caleb Train. This one's a bit special, as it's the only one of the four nominees that uses physical models on live sets. As far as the story goes, this one is much more down-to-earth than the other two. We follow Reneus as he goes about his day-to-day -day routine on the Scarlowy Railway, where during one of his trains, he's stopped by a farmer's wandering sheep. It's established in the story that this farmer has lived by the line for a long time, and though his livestock are annoying, the little engine enjoys seeing the light in his house as he passes by. But as the seasons change, and the weather becomes colder, Reneus would one day pass by the farmer's house, only to see that the light inside doesn't come back on. And later on, when he sees the farmer's daughter herding his sheep, it only confirms what he already knew. Thanks Enid, and uh, I'm sorry for your loss. And he was. This one moment, man. I wasn't expecting it to hit as hard as it did. And the way it plays into the rest of the story is something else. Reneus becomes racked with grief as the thought of his own mortality looms over him, coupled with some beautiful, albeit not so subtle, symbolism. And in one scene between him and Scarloe, it all comes out. Scarloe, do you ever think about 
the end. D do you? It's just that one day I'll stop, and I won't start again, and then that'll be that. I won't even know it was the last time until it's too late. This scene works incredibly well given the history of these two. Those of you who are savvy to the Railway series, and more importantly the book Very Old Engines, will know that Scarloe and Reneas hated each other when they first met. They constantly got on each other's nerves and argued so much they had to be parked back to back. And it's through years of working together and struggling to keep their line afloat that they finally find some sort of common ground and eventually become friends, brothers even. Reneas doesn't just confide in Scarloe because he happened to be in the right place at the right time. He does it because Scarloe is his best friend. He's the only engine he feels comfortable with being this vulnerable around. I think we all have that person in our life that we trust the same way Reneas trusts Scarloe. It's more than just being friends or family. There's something deeper about that kind of relationship. Something you can't explain, but it's there. And when put in that position, Scarloe's words, while not immediately fixing the problem, give Reneas some more to think about. Well... Even an ocean on the horizon, however vast, has an end. But it still lives. When the next day comes, Reneas is unable to make steam. He watches as the others go about their work, all the while feeling as though he can do nothing. Though it isn't long before he is company once again. Rusty returns, having found out that the part of the line where the farmer takes her sheep to the field was washed away, and tells Reneas that she won't be able to move them until the line's repaired. Hearing all this, Reneas gets an idea. Putting his feelings to the side, he manages to find that fire he once lost, and helps the farmer bring her sheep to the fields on board his train. The story ends with Reneas having learned that everything has to come to an end, yes, but it's what you do with that fleeting time that matters most. A beautiful message, wrapped up in a wonderful final visual. What more do I even need to say? And now, our final entry for the category. Alfie's Unforgettable Performance by Demon of Nowhere. This story is part of the Railway of Nowhere series, which is, in itself, part of a joint series involving the Northwestern Railway. Unlike the other nominations on this list, I don't really have a lot of history with this series. I haven't watched it front to back, and this episode was actually my first dip into it. Now, 9 times out of 10, that usually doesn't bode well for me. Jumping headfirst into a show of any kind can easily give someone the wrong idea, or even turn them away altogether. If you don't know what I mean, try jumping into the Dressrosa arc of One Piece and tell me if you understand anything. Trust me, you won't. Now, the reason I bring all this up is because I expected this to be very much the same sort of experience. And yes, while it was all new and unfamiliar and such, I actually found myself really liking this one. The story centers around a completely original cast of characters, but the two of most importance are Alfred and Evelyn. The story starts off with Alfred being assigned to pull an enthusiast train along the main line, stopping at various places along the way for passengers to get out and take pictures. Of course, this service causes holdups for the incredibly impatient Evelyn, and is where the story hits its biggest strength for me. This is not a Thomas story. It's not written like a Thomas story, it's not told like a Thomas story, and the characters do not act like Thomas characters. Instead, they have personalities all their own and bounce off one another amazingly well. You know you've struck right in gold when you can have a random viewer watch any scene and instantly understand what the characters are like. Oh, come on, man! Don't tell me you need to stop again! Evelyn, there are sheep! On the line, I can't go forward. Rubbish. You just want to stop to catch your breath again. There are literally live sheep in front of me, Evelyn. What do you expect me to do? Uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry to get out of the train, but uh, would it be all right if I took a picture of you and the sheep here? Ma'am, with all due respect, my colleague behind us would probably kill me if you did that. I especially love what this story does with its climax. Not wanting to get stuck behind Alfred again, Evelyn decides that the only reasonable course of action is to just leave earlier. 30 minutes earlier. You're having me on, right? I'm being dead serious, Alfie. And in doing so, she leaves behind the majority of her passengers, with Alfred stuck to clean up the mess. The older engine is forced to add more coaches to his train to accommodate the extra people, and sets off with Evelyn's passengers as well as his own. 
He gets on fairly well, until he spots the little tank engine in a... less than ideal situation. Begrudgingly, Evelyn owns up to her stupid mistake, and her coaches are coupled to Alfred's train. Something I really like about this episode is that despite being teased about being too old to handle long, heavy trains, Alfred not only accepts the responsibility of getting the passengers to the next station, but actually gets there without a hitch, showing that being old doesn't mean he's clapped out. This story really stuck out to me when I first watched it, if anything for its characters. It's nice to see Alfred be interpreted as anything other than outright evil, and having original characters that are actually fun is a pretty big bonus. Even with some iffy audio quirks here and there, it's still a very charming story nonetheless. And now, the fun part. Which one deserves to be called the best story of 2022? Well, in my humble opinion, that would be... Passage. This was by no means an easy decision to make, and was one that I went back and forth with a couple times. But after a lot of thinking, Passage just narrowly beats the others with its incredibly personal and thought-provoking story and downright beautiful visuals. While Lamp and Sparknote are easily more exciting stories with fun action sequences, I really love the slower, more down-to-earth approach Caleb brought to the table. Whether we like it or not, mortality is something we all have to deal with at some point. And using that idea to build on the character of Reneus, one of the oldest working engines on Sodor, is wonderful. And now, I'd like to turn things over to Caleb for a few words. Passage is by far the closest story to my heart out of everything that I've made on my channel. The story was written after I experienced a loss in my life, making it a very personal video. So I'm extremely humbled to see that it's resonated with so many. Even if it's been a comfort to just one other person, then I think it was worth making. Thank you very much. Thanks, Caleb. And now, having sufficiently made many enemies, let's continue, shall we? Our next category is sort of the inverse of what we just looked at. Adaptations. Thomas and Friends has never been a stranger to taking pre-existing ideas and making them their own. And the same holds true for the Thomas community. For this category, I'm specifically looking at adaptations of official Thomas stories, mainly to trim the fat from the surplus of people making things based off other things. Still, that doesn't mean we don't already have a metric ton of stuff to look at. Everything from railway series stories that never got brought to model life, to remakes of classic episodes, and everything in between. Thankfully, the standouts for this category were much easier to nail down, as I'm already familiar with the majority of these stories. But before we get to the winner, here's some runner-ups. First is Roman's TWR Empire's wooden railway adaptation of Grand Puff, which is one of the best wooden railway things I've seen in a while. I think the superimposed faces look pretty good, and even though it's not perfect, it's definitely faithful to the original story. There's G-Scale Sodor's adaptations of Thomas Goes Fishing and Wrong Road, both of which looking a little rough at first glance, but still have a super charming style. Of course, Oh My Sodor came close with his version of Cross Lines, and the CGI adaptation of Duck Takes Charge by Skips is just... <laughs> incredible. But while all those were great, there was one adaptation that stood apart from the rest. A retelling of arguably the most famous railway series story, and one that everyone wanted me to talk about way back when. The winner for best adaptation is... Super Rescue by Ryan Sock. This adaptation, in my opinion, does just about everything right. The narration is lively, entertaining, and most importantly, clean. The visuals echo and build upon the original book while still staying true to the model series. And while the story still starts very abruptly, something that seems to be a trend from the book it comes from, it still smooths out all of the technical dialogue, making the story far more accessible for the average viewer. For a story that never made it to the TV series, this version certainly gives me a good idea of what could have been. And for that, I'm proud to present Ryan Sock with this award. I'd now like to turn things over to him for a few words. Thank you to everyone who nominated my take on Super Rescue for Best Adaptation. I know there's an endless amount of takes on this story, so I really feel honored that the version I've made has resonated with you all. The idea for doing a TV series Super Rescue to the 4.30 runtime was one I'd had in my back pocket for ages. First attempts at a script rotting in my Google Docs since August 2020. I finally got around to it this year though. It was a really fun video to do, and I'm very thankful that you all enjoyed it. I can't forget Sudi Subbar Productions. His vocal talents are really something special and elevate the video. A huge thanks to him for recording the narration and being a fantastic friend. Make sure to check him out. Also, shout out to Noob, Jean, Kelsub Jake, and everyone else in the video workshop too. Thanks for letting me use your Thomas Savior. 
I don't really have anything else to say, so before I wrap up, be sure to check out Tugs Continued on Twitter and read the scripts we've been putting up. If you like Tugs, I'm sure you'll enjoy them. And make sure to check out the Video Workshop channel. Me and the other writers there have lots of really cool original stories in store for the future, so stay tuned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Now that we've taken an extensive look on individual stories, let's shift our focus over to which creator has the best overarching series. Before we get into things, I want to say right off the bat that I didn't watch every episode of every series that was submitted. Some of these series have been going on for years, and while many of them are very good, it was just too much for me to binge all in one go. However, sticking to the rules, I first went to see if the series had been updated at some point this year. After that, I watched the most recent episode of said series, and then skimmed around a bit to see if there were any standout pieces. And boy, did this race come down to the wire. But before we take a look at the big winner, let's go over some honorable mentions. While my original intention was to be looking at series that focus exclusively on telling stories, I was actually surprised by how many people submitted series that talked about Thomas. I hadn't even considered options like Train Boy's Day Out with Thomas or Train of Thought's history stuff, so kudos to those who thought outside the box. As for the series themselves, the dark side of Day Out with Thomas, while being a bit of a glorified slideshow, makes up for it with some great commentary on the part of Train Boy. Comedy is incredibly subjective, and while I don't think every joke hits its mark, the majority of them do, and I can't say I wasn't entertained while watching. On the flip side, you have Train of Thought, whose videos are much more serious and history-driven. And while again, I'm not as familiar with his work as I am with others, I found his videos clean, concise, and very well put together. And then on top of that, there were tons of other series that did fit into my original plan. Enterprising Engines was a major contender, what with its balance of comedy, amazing presentation, and oddly sinister story beats that showed up fairly sporadically. Here's a little refresher. A part in my revenge, no matter how small, is a privilege. Because what I'm going to do to the Fat Controller's Railway is more than a perfect ending. It's more than a grand design. It's my creation. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it. And while I love the idea of an overarching story that ties all those little details together by the end, the infrequentness of said details, mixed with some strange scripting moments and whatever this is, made it just barely fall short of making it for me. Another big contender was How in the Lost Engine by Blue Snowplow, a horror series that's short, concise, and was frustratingly close to winning several awards throughout this competition. And if part 4 hadn't been so exposition heavy, with the big spooky ghost monologuing at us for half the video, it might have taken the win. It's a slow burn that gradually builds on the story, and doesn't have to rely solely on gore and or jump scares to make me uneasy. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have Railways of Cartoona, which is one of the most bonkers things I've ever seen in my entire life. To the point where I wasn't even sure it counted as a Thomas thing until... There he is! And then finally, we have Sodor Then and Now, which came so gosh darn close on looks alone. Seriously, what is it with Tomy creators and having fantastic sets? But once again, there came time to make a choice. And there was one series that, through its ideas, scale, and less is more approach, ended up taking home the prize. The winner of Best Series in 2022 is... The Stories of Sodor by Victor Tanzik. For some, this may come as a massive upset, and for others, this might not be a big surprise. Regardless of where you stand, I want to explain to the best of my ability why I think this series has earned its spot here today. The Stories of Sodor does a lot of things right, from its characters, to its presentation, to the sheer amount of lore that exists within it. Heck, if we're gonna start anywhere, let's start there. This show has some of my favorite world building of any fan series. I recently went back and binged the entire thing for a future video, and the satisfaction I had in getting to see all the little bits of setup for future seasons paid off was an experience I've only had with one other Thomas series in the past. It frames Sodor in a completely different, yet still fascinating way, and in some ways actually eclipses the lore of the Railway series in my opinion. That's not to say that the Railway series isn't great, or a love letter to steam engines, but all of the really interesting lore isn't incorporated into the books in any meaningful way. Instead, it's laid out in anthology material, and structured more like a textbook than an actual story. 
In fact, other than the neat novelty of knowing what the island was like way back when, I'd almost call this book pointless to the overall plot of the series. Seriously, when have details like Kirk Ronan's electrical plant or the existence of the railroad ever been important in any of the books? Sure, they're cool little ideas, and they fill in gaps in the island's history, but if you took them out, it wouldn't really change all that much. Compare that with the stories of Sodor, where every piece of history adds something to the world and provides avenues for potential stories. The rival companies, the box tanks, the countless times they expand the railway, and the effects of modernization on the engines. Every beat affects the overarching plot in some way. Speaking of which, can we talk about the engines? This might come off as me brown-nosing Victor a little bit, but his takes on the characters are hands down my favorite iterations to ever come out of Thomas and Friends, official or otherwise. Go look at a handful of stories about, say, Diesel, and take a shot every time the story makes him out to be an unlikable asshole who gets his comeuppance in the end. You will think you have 12 fingers, 5 nipples, and 3 dicks by the time you're done. I can think of maybe three exceptions where Diesel actually gets a story that isn't him just being an awful person. Contrast that with the stories of Sodor where, yes, Diesel gets plenty of despicable moments, but also develops as a character, all culminating in one of the best stories I've ever seen him used in. And this holds true for other characters, like Thomas in fact. Sure, everyone likes the cheeky prick Thomas and his antics, but they get old after a while. Here, Thomas is portrayed less as an entitled jerk-off, and more like an experienced underdog who can clutch things out when he needs to. He's not perfect, and he still retains that snappiness that Thomas is known for, but he's got a lot more history and character development that Victor really puts into play during the later seasons. Easily my favorite interpretation of the character. And finally, the presentation. Now yes, I am aware that there are other series that have a lot more flair to them than this one does. However, this is where that less is more mentality comes into play. Not everything has to be put through the Adobe After Effects machine a hundred times to be engaging, and in some cases, I think it actually hurts the end product more than it helps it. Fancy angles, shots, and effects are great when they're done well, but when they're not, they can look really sloppy. There's nothing inherently wrong with a simpler approach, and in Victor's case, that limitation breeds new creative ideas that I don't think would have been possible if he was able to do exactly what he needed to do to make a scene work. I plan to go into more detail one day on why I love this series as much as I do, but for now, I'm more than happy to say that as far as this competition is concerned, it's more than earned the right to carry this award. Congratulations, Victor. I'd now like to turn things over to him for a few words. Hello everyone, Victor Tanzig here, and I'm very happy about that. You're the reason my series has been a success, and I can't thank you enough. I would also like to thank Play Don't Pause for holding this event. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe to their channel. Anyway, I better wrap this up before I start to ramble. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good one. Thanks, Victor. Whew. Okay, let's try something a little easier. Best Editor. Unlike the last few categories, this one was way simpler to quantify, as unlike stories, good editing is pretty objective when you know what you're looking at. However, while there was a very clear frontrunner, the honorable mentions were by no means left in the dust. The real Xbox nerd has some incredibly funny YouTube poop videos, this one edit by Mason Day is incredible, and though it's very rough around the edges, the Smudger movie by LL Company is really impressive for what it tried to do. However, none of those quite measured up to the sheer amount of technical aptitude that this next entry had. The winner of Best Editor for 2022 is... Percy and the Beast Productions. To call the work done on this channel impressive would be an understatement. The amount of time and effort that goes into creating each individual shot for these videos is nearly impossible for me to describe with words alone. But trust me when I say that scenes like this... don't just happen by themselves. They take time, a lot of technical skill, and a very creative mind to get right. I wouldn't say every custom shot on this channel looks as good as it could be. There are a couple times where they've tried to replace a face and, I mean, look at it. But the number of times I'm like, dang, that looks good, far outweighs the stuff that looks a little wonky. I think my favorite has to be their adaptation of Sodor and the SCP. The story is, ridiculous, but wow does the presentation make up for it. And for those reasons, I'm proud to name Percy and the Beast Productions the best editor of 2022. 
congratulations. I'd now like to turn things over to them for a few words. Hello everyone, Nick speaking. Many moons ago, I submitted my entry into Plato and Paz's Steam Awards, and I just got the incredible news that I was apparently nominated for the Best Editor Award. I simply can't believe this, and I never thought that my channel would spread this far across the fandom. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into each and every shot in my videos, making sure that each video installment is exactly how I want it. In my eyes, I think that this achievement is very well earned. I'd like to show infinite amounts of gratitude to Brave Gfar, Dan the Blue Tank, Shanks, Sotofalet Studios, and to all the people who inspired me and helped me to achieve success. If you thought that the Hero of the Empire and the Beginning of Madness were good, you were entirely wrong. Toby and the Multiverse of Chaos will be an entirely different breed. So long, everyone! Sticking with the theme of presentation, let's move on to the category that goes hand in hand with this one, Cinematography. In the world of media, a good editor is also a good cinematographer. They need to know what shots they need, how they can get them, and the most effective way to use them. And heading into this category, it was clear that this was going to be a race between the best of the best. What I hadn't expected was how versatile people would be able to get with their shots, angles, and compositions using Train Simulator. Remember, this isn't a filming software. It's not meant to do things like this, and yet, here we are. I've already talked about the stellar work done by Carson and his team, but there were plenty more that genuinely surprised me. NWR Chris has a really cool teaser for an upcoming series. Highland Girl by Trains the Brains was also really polished and well done. And shoot, there were a good chunk of people who had amazing traditional cinematography too. The Train Modeler, oh my gosh, I swear, if I didn't know any better, I'd have thought he was David Mitten himself. His sets look beautiful, his model work is second to none. If anyone can mimic the classic era style, it's him. So how do you even top all of that? How do you do better than this? And this? And this? Well, someone found a way. The award for best cinematography of 2022 goes to... Blowback by Ride. Right, right. Oh, fuck. Keep my name out your fucking mouth! Ryder Ronan. This is, without question, the best, most creative camera work I've seen done in trains in a long time. The sequence where Harold gets up close and personal with Henry is honestly the highlight of this entire video. Shots like this just weren't possible in the model series, and very rarely have the same seriousness in the CGI series. But combining the two styles here makes for a video that is thrilling as it is beautiful. This isn't a one-off either. Ryder Ronan consistently makes a visual spectacle of his work. Whether that be music videos, cinematic shorts, or in this case, an action-packed Thomas story that looks like it was ripped right out of Sodor's Legend of the Lost Treasure. And while I can certainly name plenty of creators that have come close, nobody quite nails the jaw-dropping eye candy that has earned Ryder Ronan this award. Congratulations. I'd like to turn things over to him for a few words. Hi everyone, this is Aiden, and I'm super thankful to be a part of this, and I give my huge thanks to anyone out there who watches all my silly little videos. Uh, making trains videos is just something I really enjoy doing, and through this YouTube journey, I'm just so overwhelmed by all the positive support I've received in all my projects. I couldn't make the things that I do without the Extended Railway Series team at Soda Island Fansite and Carson and the team at Video Workshop. Both have been extremely supportive with their help and guidance, and I thank them so much every day. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I love you guys. And now that we've spent ample time talking about stories and presentation, I think it's time to change gears a bit and take a look at a different style of video. Let's have a peek at essays. Video essays have been sort of a rising trend among the Thomas community, thanks in no small part to a certain review of an infamous Mattel marketing misstep. I'm actually surprised it took this long for people to branch out from the standard movie reviews and top 10s to talk about Thomas in such a nuanced way. And I won't lie, it was kinda liberating to know just how much stuff could be done with this series outside of filmmaking. And those submissions for this category came in thick and fast. I was surprised and once again refreshed to find that this would be one of the smallest categories of the show. What wasn't refreshing to find, however, was the difference between each nomination winning or not being even thinner than it was in previous categories. However, I eventually narrowed it down to four. Those being All at Sea by Usual Bloke Luke, Thomas's Moral Compass by The Thomas Cynic, In the Face of Reality by Scrapyard Studios, and The Danger of Runaways by Amtrak Guy. Choosing between these four videos was... hard, to say the least, as an argument could be made for each one of them taking the award. 
And so, I think a closer look is in order. Let's start with Luke. Luke's All at Sea video was a real left hook for me when I first watched it. Not only because its runtime is easily four times the length of the original story, but because there's surprisingly little fat to be taken out. The video itself, in a nutshell, is how the episode All at Sea uses very subtle methods to teach an important lesson to children. The essay is broken up into four distinct sections, none of which feeling like they drag their feet for a particularly long period of time. This is genuinely impressive to me, considering that there's every opportunity for the pace to come to a grinding halt and boring the viewer into watching something else. Long videos should, in my opinion, have something to keep you engaged, whether that be multiple items, talking points, and so on. Having your viewer look at the same footage and hear the same points again and again and again gets repetitive after a while. And I'm glad to say that Luke certainly nailed the pacing here. He points out a lot of stuff in this episode that I never really thought about, like this interaction between Duck and Percy. Well, Duck, I'd rather have my wheels on solid ground. Our rails can take us to all the places we could ever wish to see. Like, I never made that connection, but yeah. Percy would totally be against the idea of sailing, considering his past two experiences with water. Another big highlight for me is how this video wraps up. It's warm, comfortable, and full of life in a way nowhere else in the world can be. It's home. I think the font choice could be a little better, but other than that, it's great. As for negatives, I don't love the weird background playing behind the video. It's really hard to look at, though thankfully he has replaced it with something easier on the eyes in his other videos. And I did also find his mic a bit tinny, though the voiceover itself is clean and clear, with no awkwardly worded or over-descriptive lines. Overall, a very strong entry, but can it compete with the next one? Thomas's Moral Compass by The Thomas Cynic. The Thomas Cynic is actually a YouTuber I've covered once in the past. Well, kinda. I did a stream a long time ago where I watched and critiqued a lot of videos, one of which being his video on Thomas and Gordon. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I wasn't that impressed with what I was looking at. I didn't think his points landed all that well, the video was presented in a box yet still has bars on it for some reason, and worst of all, what he says doesn't match what's on screen. In fact, it felt more like he was just throwing in clips wherever to fill space, which is fine for lesser moments, but the whole video felt like that. Needless to say, as an essay, it wasn't very engaging for me. Now take that format and turn it into, say, a podcast and it would work fine, but here it just doesn't work. So, if that's all the case, then what changed in the three months between these two videos? Well, surprisingly, a lot. For starters, the script is way stronger this time around, and uses its episode as effectively as possible. This is where looking at different eras of a show comes into play. Luke wrote a 16-minute video talking about a classic series episode. It has a setup, three big talking points, and an ending. The episode has a lot to say, and the video earns its 16-minute runtime. The Thomas Cynic, on the other hand, is looking at a Hit-era episode. And I'm sorry, but there's no way you could get me to sit down and watch a 16-minute essay on a single Hit-era episode. Not Respect for Gordon, not Thomas on the Statue, and certainly not Hector the Horrid. And thankfully, the Thomas Cynic knew this and wrote his script accordingly. The main points he makes about this episode are how Thomas has developed as a character, how he reacts when he's not in control of a situation, and how the moral for this episode is handled. And yeah, it's a pretty solid take. Though with that being said, it is still just a little too long and wordy in my opinion, and I think taking out another minute or two would have really helped the video. This leads me to his presentation, which while also being an improvement, still leaves a lot to be desired. There are more than a few moments where the voiceover and visuals just don't match up as well as they could, and I counted a couple of times where things just seemed… weird. I get there's not a lot of footage to work with, but a good editor can always make things work. Sure, the longer video doesn't help, but again, trimming just a bit more of that fat would work wonders. Next up, In the Face of Reality by Scrapyard Studios. Okay, now this is a fun one. For those who don't know, back when the Railway series was still in publication, a number of kids wrote in to Audrey asking why some engines have faces and others didn't. A good question, and one that I doubt Wilbert had thought of when he asked for Tally Clinn to be written into the Railway series. I'm assuming the reason that he asked for John Kenny to illustrate the engine the way he did was in part because he didn't want to give the illusion to children that there were real talking steam engines on a real railway that they could go visit. 
only for said kids to be disappointed when they found out that that wasn't the case. Keep in mind, this was at a time when the Tally Clin was still struggling to find its footing, and the last thing they needed was a bunch of whiny kids complaining about how they'd been lied to. But instead of saying something like, oh, nobody really knows why the engines have faces, which would have been a perfectly fine excuse, by the way, he instead claims that the real reason was that the engines only have faces when they're on Sodor. Now, this might be a hot take in of itself, but I hate hate this explanation. Because not only did he break his own rule in the very next story, not only did he then go and write a whole other story that also disregards this rule, and not only did he explain away an important detail in his real-life-based book series with fucking magic, but this on-the-fly explanation doesn't even work with his already established lore. Tell me, where is Toby when he's on his own line? Because I'll bet my left testicle it isn't on Sodor, at least in the Railway series. Shut up. It's such a paper-thin excuse that actually hurts the series more than it helps it. And I don't know why he thought it was a good idea. <sighs> okay, rant over. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh right. In the Face of Reality by Scrapyard Studios is a video that sheds light on a few theories about how this whole face thing actually works. And to be frank, this is the funniest entry out of the four options. There's plenty of quick jabs at the source material, and though it does somewhat feel like the video is talking at me rather than to me, I think the commentary meshes well with the humor. I also love the visuals used in this one. The original footage really elevates the talking points, and is a nice change of pace from just seeing the book illustrations and clips from the show. It certainly makes this video feel unique. Unfortunately, the other big reason this video stands out visually is the bright orange background that permeates throughout the entire video. I get that orange is a big part of this channel's branding, but it can be super hard to look at for an extended amount of time. And the last thing you need is for viewers to get tired of looking at your video. If it was just, like, slightly less saturated and bright, with maybe a small bit of texture or detail in the background, it would have made this video so much easier to look at. That being said, I do recognize that a bright background isn't a massive deal breaker for some, and you know what? Fair enough. It's a fairly small issue in the grand scheme of things. A much bigger problem with this video comes with its audio. Like I said before, I have no problem with Scrapyard Studios' commentary other than it being a bit shouty. However, it's the commentary of his guest speakers that really hurts this video for me. When you use sound bites in your videos, it should, at the very least, do two things. A, help convey your point easier, and B, keep your viewer engaged without breaking the flow of the video. And if I'm being honest, these clips fail to do both of these things, at least for me. For starters, they're way too quiet. The mic gets passed to another creator three separate times in this video, and all three times are just barely intelligible. Here, have a listen. But even really, the steam engines in Thomas are really steam engines before they're people. You know, like they may say, they may talk, they may have faces, but the things that the engines say and do are really means to an end. When you think of a steam engine in real life, you don't typically picture them with a face. Typically, you picture them with a smoke box door. Do the engines on Sodor really have faces? And who other than the reader can see them? See what I mean? Scrapyard Studios' voice is way louder than his guests. Oh, we'll just turn up the volume, you're probably saying. And sure, if I wanted to, I could pause the video, crank my audio up, and hear what they have to say, but... As much as I love Sam's videos, I think this theory scratches more heads than Joker's. This may sound like an oh, woe is me thing, but stuff like this should be dealt with before the video is shipped out. It's a pace breaker, and an annoying one at that because it's so easy to fix. It also doesn't help that in the case of Tail Lamp Studios, the big point he's trying to convey just isn't explained very well. When you think of a steam engine in real life, you don't typically picture them with a face. Typically, you picture them with a smoke box door. And since Audrey's universe is meant to take place in a real life universe, then this theory doesn't seem all that surprising. Like, did anyone follow that at all? Now, I'd originally thought that this was just a poor choice in clip, and in the interest of fairness, I went back and watched the video that that clip came from. And no, I'm sorry, but it still isn't clear what he's trying to get across. And because of that, I don't think this clip was really helpful in explaining an already confusing theory. With all that being said, this video still has a lot going for it. It chugs along at a pretty smooth pace, it tackles a novel topic in a fun way, and it has an identity all its own. 
And last but not least for this segment, we have Amtrak Guy with his video on how Thomas and Friends captures the danger of a runaway train. This video really threw a wrench in my final decision for a couple of reasons. Unlike all the other submissions in this category, I'd never actually seen this video before. I knew of it, I saw it blowing up in my recommended feed, but I never actually sat down to watch it. And, well, shit, it's actually pretty good. This video sets out to break down all the little nuances that Thomas and Friends uses to show off the real threat of a runaway train. After all, the train, for its size, is one of the strongest vehicles on land. These things can move hundreds of tons of cargo across long distances, thanks in no small part to the lack of friction the rails provide. So when one of them is let loose without a crew, it's a real danger to every one and everything around it. And I think that this video does an exemplary job of explaining each of its points, using the episodes it's analyzing as building blocks to walk the audience through what makes these scenes work. It also helps that Amtrak Guy has a really good microphone and speaking voice to match. His read is damn good, feeling more like a conversation than a presentation. From the shoes of the human characters, this is a really bad situation. You have a runaway locomotive on the main line with absolutely no way of stopping itself. James could hit a car at a crossing, derail on a curve, smash into a siding, or hit another train. However, editing-wise, I think this one is pretty weak. He uses the same shots over and over and over again. There are times where, yes, it does make sense to give things a once-over, but when you do it super frequently, it starts to get repetitive, if not boring. When writing a script, it's important to think about what visuals you want to show your audience and at what time. And while these visuals do match what he's saying, it's clear that he wasn't thinking about how many times he'd show us the same bits of footage. And there's nothing visually distinct to make this video stand on its own. It's by no means a bad essay, it just doesn't have the same showmanship as the others. And now, having gone over the four nominees, it's time to see who took home the gold. The winner for Best Essay of 2022 is... Usual Bloke Luke. This was another close one, in part because all four videos had a lot of really good stuff in them, with just one or two things I didn't like. However, Luke's video on All at Sea has far more ups than it has downs, and its downs are not nearly as game-changing. In saying that, this was still an incredibly close race, with the deciding factor coming down to the smallest of details. I'd now like to turn things over to Luke to say a few words. Hey there everyone! Words cannot describe how honoured I am to have one of my videos win Best Video Essay for the Steamy Awards. It really can, but I'm gonna do my best anyway, cause well, I need a, yeah, I, I need a speech for this. <laughs> the time when I made this video, analysing All at Sea, um, it was definitely an eventful one. It was the first time my channel was starting to gain major traction and it was the one year anniversary of my Henry video uh, where I started making Thomas content in the first place. It ignited a spark in me for talking in depth about specific episodes of the show and their deeper meanings. Never did I ever expect my channel to grow so fast during this last year, let alone have one of my videos be nominated for an award show for fan content. 2022 has been a crazy year for Thomas fan content, and knowing that fans like you voted for me for this award, it, it, it really, really means a lot. So much more than you think, because I literally would not be doing this without your engagement and lovely responses to what I do. I'd like to thank the Steam Music Academy, which in this case is Play Don't Pause, as well as thank the Unlucky Tug, whose excellent videos inspire my Thomas content. It was awesome to meet you at the Audrey Extravaganza, mate. It really was. My family for supporting me in what I do on and off YouTube. My Thomas fan friends, Jack, Harry and Robin, who I met this year and have shared many laughs with, especially at the Audrey Extravaganza. And biggest of all, any one of you who watched any of my videos. Because thanks to you... I feel like I have a purpose in what I do on this channel, and throughout all the time I spend editing, hating the sound of my own voice in the audio, and the existence of my inconsistent upload schedule I'm sure you are all familiar with, you make it all worth it in the end. I am a Thomas content creator online, but I am a Thomas fan at heart. Thank you. 
Now, let's take a look at something a little more lighthearted. Shorts. No, not those kinds. Yeah, that. It wasn't until I started looking through the submissions that I learned something about the Thomas community. Y'all got some strange senses of humor. It is time to pay the consequences. No. no more Peter Sam Tunnel. <laughs> For real though, I honestly found the shorts for this category incredibly interesting. Unlike normal videos, which are often tamer and more down to earth, when it comes to shorts, literally anything goes. You want a character select screen? You got it. You want parodies of Top Gear? You got it. You want all engines go Thomas chasing Percy in a Sodor Fallout setting while cracking meta jokes about the current state of the franchise? I'm gonna chug. I'm gonna chew. I'm gonna <laughs> Oh, you got it. The entries here were a weird and wonderful mess of suggestions, with some genuinely cool stuff in there as well. Without a doubt, one of the biggest highlights was this video of a guy pulling Thomas out of a TV and placing him in a kid's book. It's mesmerizing on its own, but the video breaking down how he does it was even cooler. Tons of Trackmasters also fits the bill, if not inadvertently. His videos are short, snappy, and don't waste too much time, which is important considering he's talking about a piece of plastic. I do think he could slow down a little when he speaks, but I'd hardly call his style bad. However, there was one that stood out amongst the rest. Not because it was particularly funny, but because it wasn't. In fact, it was one of the most somber and bittersweet things I've seen attempted in Thomas. And that entry is... Why It's Called Henry's Forest by Great Western Legacy. In keeping with the short format, I'll try to make this brief. I love this little video. It's set long after the Northwestern Railway's heyday, in a time when the steam engines have either been retired, sold off, or scrapped. We learn about one such engine who was spared from the cutter's torch, and given the option of where to be stored until his crew can find a buyer. Slowly, with gentle movements of the camera, we come to find that the engine left alone in the forest is Henry. And though he has nothing to protect him from the elements, save for what little shelter the trees provide, you can tell that there's no place he'd rather be. What can I even say? It's beautiful, poetic, and a perfect end to the big green engine's long story. And because of that, it's earned the title of Best Short. And now, a few words from Great Western Legacy. Hello, I'm Great Western Legacy, and I just want to say I'm really thankful for being nominated for Best Short. This wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for all the amazing and talented creators in the Thomas community who make the tools that myself and others use to make these sort of shorts and videos. And thank you once again to Play Don't Pause. He's an amazing creator, and you should totally subscribe to him and go like all of his videos. Jeez, that was supposed to be the lighthearted category? Well, let's stray away from the video-making side of the fandom for a bit and talk about some of the other niches this community has to offer. And considering the source material, I think it's best to start with the most popular pastime among Thomas fans, modeling. I think it's fair to say that if it wasn't for the model style, Thomas wouldn't have been nearly as successful as it was. A cartoon just doesn't compare with the live models on real sets. And even after the show long abandoned this style in favor of CGI, the amount of people still making Thomas models based off the show is amazing. Like, there's not a doubt in my mind if the fans band together, they'd be able to bring back the show. And because there's so much talent being thrown around, it should be no surprise that this was the hardest category to judge. As someone who's only dabbled in modeling from time to time, say hello Hercules, <laughs> the instant I thought I found a winner, I'd be shown like 10 more submissions that were just as good. There were tons of models to choose from, ranging from TV series replicas, to original characters, to new takes on existing characters, and oh my gosh, don't even get me started on all the custom Bachman and Trackmaster models floating around. Train Boy is the obvious go-to example here. His N-Gage Lady is probably my favorite from his fleet, just for how adorably tiny it is. But then you've got guys like Flying Pringle and Tank Engine John John, who I'm convinced just stole the original TV series models before Drayton Manor could get their hands on them. And Frogs' Sodor Fallout Thomas looks like it wants to haunt my dreams. But having gone through all those submissions, there was one that stuck out amongst the rest. Not because it was the most accurate to the show, but because of just how damn cool it was. And that model is Percy by Train Builder. This model is awesome. Name another model in this lineup that not only steams, but can actually be ridden on. I've always had a soft spot in my heart for little trains that can actually give you rides. As a kid, my parents brought me to this one place where you could ride on a similar train and go around a giant loop. 
and this model certainly brings back memories of going for ride after ride on that cloudy day. Even though it doesn't quite look like Percy, it's still amazing, novel, and a great piece of engineering. And for those reasons, I think it's earned the title of Best Model in 2022. Keeping with the theme of creation, let's have a look at what the artists in the Thomas fandom have to offer. Like modeling, art is something I've dabbled in from time to time, but it was never really something I excelled at. Ask me to design a logo? Sure. But ask me to draw a steam engine? Eh, that's a bit outside my wheelhouse. The winner of Best Artist of 2022 is... William Dawson. I don't think I need to say a lot to explain why I love these illustrations so much. From the color palette, to the use of lighting, to the little details that you only notice upon a closer look, these illustrations dwarf even Peter and Gunver in my opinion. Out of all of them, this one of Oliver is my favorite. It's easily some of the best art I've come across, and not just in the realm of the Thomas fandom. Congratulations. And to cap off this little trilogy of niche content, let's talk about music. Music is, in my opinion, the heart and soul of media. Even if a show isn't what you hoped it would be, a good soundtrack can still make a world of difference. And when it comes to Thomas and Friends, music is paramount. Everyone in the fandom has a song that sticks out to them. Thomas's anthem will always be a go-to for me, with Thomas You're the Leader being a close second. And while the show hasn't always been consistent with its music, I certainly think it has more good than bad. That being said, when the fans got their hands on the same tools used to compose the themes for the classic series, it was like someone had opened the floodgates for banger songs and covers left and right. Now, I had only planned to look at original songs, since I think covers are a bit easy in comparison. However, because there were so many submissions for genuinely awesome covers, I decided to give a second award for best cover song, which we'll look at first. As far as covers go, there were plenty of options, but only one that really stood out to me, both for being a great recomposition and a great vocal performance. And that talented creator is... Headmaster Hastings, with his cover of Let's Have a Race. There's just something about Headmaster Hastings' covers that feels... right. Maybe it's his choice of modern instruments, maybe it's his deeper voice. I don't know. What I do know is that his covers are some that I always find myself coming back to. And this song is no exception. Here, just have a listen. I don't think I need to explain myself any further here. However, we're not quite done with music just yet. There's still an award for best original song up for grabs. And there's one person in particular who not only clinched the title for best original song, but was pretty much the only person this year to produce original music. You know them, you love them, you've been hearing their songs all video, it's SA Music. Before I get to the song that won the award, I want to take a moment to talk about their work as a whole. In my opinion, SA Music and those like him are the backbone of Thomas's presence on YouTube. Nine times out of ten, when you watch a video from the Thomas fandom, it's going to have music from at least one of these legends. I think people underestimate how important music is, not only for filling the empty space when no one's talking, but in how it sets the mood for a video. Music gives everything flavor, and for me, it's one of the most important and frustrating parts of making a video. But thanks to SA Music, I no longer am solely reliant on YouTube's hit or miss selection of music on the creator studio. From remakes of character themes, to covers, to original pieces, this channel has it all. I know it sounds like I'm doing an ad for them right now, but seriously, I'm so thankful to have a resource like this to fall back on. And I'm sure just about every creator in this community feels the same way. But now the question is, which one of his songs earned him the award? That would be Eyes on the Prize. For such a short song, it's a bop. It's catchy, it's got fun instruments, and it feels like a game show song. That aside, I think SA Music more than deserves this award, not only for his amazing talent, but for his service to the fandom as a whole. It just wouldn't be the same without people like him. Next up is our first wildcard category, Most Creative. In a world where anyone with an internet connection can make a video, the spectrum for ideas is nearly infinite. Just when you think you've seen it all, you find something that makes you go, shit, why didn't I think of that? 
Much like with shorts, this category is a grab bag of videos, some of which I've never even seen prior to this competition. Some were weird, some were wild, but out of all of them, three channels stuck out to me. Those three being Train Boy, Caleb C, and Major Engine Studios. Let's dive in, starting with Train Boy. It's fitting for Train Boy to be in a wildcard category, considering that he's a bit of a wildcard himself. What I mean by that is while most channels would try to stick to doing one thing and doing it very well, with Train Boy, you never really know what to expect. Sometimes you get a video about models or the unboxing of such, other times you'll get a history video or something analytical, and sometimes he just goes completely off the rails with We fucking got it! Dubs, dubs, dubs. Is that Peppa Pig as an engine? No! I was right there! And we'll it's very much a case-by-case -case basis with him, which in my opinion adds to the fun of his content. Lance has gone on record in the past saying he takes heavy inspiration from JonTron, and I think that style of content really shows in the videos he makes. However, with that being said, I think the argument could be made that sometimes he plays things a little... safe. It's hard to describe, but if you watch one of his earlier videos, and then take a look at his most recent stuff, it feels like he's restraining himself a bit. I can, to an extent, understand censoring himself when he swears and whatnot, though in practice it can be a little jarring, but he's certainly toned down the parts of his videos that, in my opinion, help him stand out from the crowd. If there's anything I could offer as a suggestion for what to improve on, it's to be a little more liberal with his comedy. Next up, Caleb C. This channel is much simpler to summarize, as it centers almost entirely around remaking Thomas episodes in the style of Ivor the Engine. Now, I'm not terribly familiar with Ivor the Engine, but from what I've seen, yeah, I can see the resemblance. I'm not super fond of the style for how weird it can look, but I'll wholeheartedly put my hands up and say that this is still very impressive, if only for how much work has clearly gone into making these videos. With that being said, I don't think this style really works for Thomas. The 2D approach here just doesn't fit, and its perspective is just not right at points. Like here, in this side shot, we're able to see the fronts of all the engines. If this were a 3D shot, the camera would be placed at roughly a three quarters angle. But then when James pulls away, we can see the faces on the backs of the freight cars, which just really clashes with the angle we're being shown. This isn't the only shot where this happens either, and it just makes things look awkward. Now to be completely fair, this issue isn't exclusive to this particular video. All Engines Go has the exact same problem, where they want to show the characters' faces, but the perspective demands it stay in 2D for some scenes for easy animating. This is where we start delving into how different mediums help elevate the presentation of a show, so I'm gonna stop right here before I go down a rabbit hole. The point is that this style, while not perfect, is very impressive considering the medium, and not something I've ever seen done before. If anything, it's certainly memorable. And last up for the category, Thomas and Birdie's Major Race by Major Engine Studios. Now, at the time of the submissions, this video hadn't actually come out yet. At least, not properly. The only thing I had to judge at the time was the preview and everything else the channel had done. And even just looking at the preview on its own, I can say that I was very impressed with what I saw. This video is made in trains, but uses a style of video that wouldn't be out of place in 2009. This type of content was heavily popularized by people like Joey Turner and Miss Oliver and Blossom, and is a style I've affectionately dubbed the 5 o'clock shadow style. I'll give you three guesses as to why that is. However, while a very unique style, I really don't like it as much as I did back in the day. What? Not only has it aged particularly poorly relative to its peers, but it reeks of 2009 humor. Ah! Engines don't eat. Huh? Yeah, you get the picture. So, why was I impressed with this video in particular? Well, despite breaking literally every rule I have when assessing a video about the funny blue train show, it's actually really good. The editing, the animation, the voice acting, the jokes, it's all solid and left me excited for the final product. I'm kind of at a loss for words on this one. This video falls into the same category for me as something like SpongeBob Beyond or Fazbear and Friends. Like, it's so bizarre, but good at the same time. Maybe I'm not giving the 5 o'clock shadow style enough credit, but like, this shouldn't work. It has everything going against it, and yet, I can't say anything bad about it. It's just put together too well. And now that we've looked at Train Boy, Caleb C, and Major Engine Studios, it's time to announce the winner. I went back and forth on this one for a bit, but eventually I decided that the award for most creative had to go to... Train Boy. 
This came right down to the wire. While I love the editing on display for Thomas and Bertie's Major Race, and admire the work that goes into remaking an episode in the style of Ivor the Engine, there's nobody quite like Lance in this community. He's a jack of all trades when it comes to video making, and never sticks to one type of video. And as somebody who appreciates variety and the desire to keep things fresh, what can I say? He nails it. Congratulations, Lance. Our second wildcard spot is a bit of a doozy, not only because of how close the competition was, but because the winner for this category actually changed several times. That category being most ambitious. To me, there are few things more important to the creative process than ambition. Without ambition, nobody would push themselves to do bigger and better things. And as you might imagine, any attempt to recreate one of the most expensive kids shows in recent history is gonna be ambitious in some way. However, when I started looking through the submissions, I found that there were way more than just imitations of the show. There were giant model layouts, a rewritten version of The Adventure Begins, a rewritten version of the entire Railway series asking what would happen if Edward was never there, and so much more. And on the side of filmmaking, oh baby. Sidekick Jason has some amazing looking sets for his Tomy videos, as does the 1966 kids. And the model work by 25 and Soku is wildly good. However, there were two nominees that I ended up landing on, those people being ThomasFan2002 and Mr. Ryan. Both of these channels have done amazing work, yet have very conflicting styles. Tracks to Big Adventures and The Henry Movie are ridiculously different, yet I found they both have a lot going for them. I eventually want to make videos on both of these at some point, so for now, I'll try to keep things brief. Let's start with Tracks to Big Adventures. At its core, this series is designed to be a reimagining of the Big World Big Adventures rebrand from 2018. You know, the rebrand that killed the show… again. Now, there are plenty of videos online that have torn this rebrand to shreds, but out of all of them, I only saw one video explaining how to make all of Mattel's stupid ideas work. And I'm not gonna lie, the unlucky tug outdid himself with this section of the video. But little did I know that it was only a matter of time before someone took those ideas and made them a reality. Enter Tracks to Big Adventures. This series was created by ThomasFan2002, and holy fuck, it's actually pretty solid. Watching this makes me feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. Unlike the official show, the episodes actually build off of one another with real continuity, and the amount of stupid bullshit has been severely cut back. I'm also impressed with the insistence to stick to the CGI style. While I don't think the CGI faces look particularly good when they're static, mostly because they're designed to be moving and making different expressions, I gotta give them credit for not taking the easy out and using the model series models for the 100th time. It gives this series a flavor that feels unique. And the same can pretty much be said for the writing. It's in the style of the Brenner era, which I haven't always liked, but it is different, and I think it's refreshing to see someone break out of the classic series formula. While this series can look a bit uncanny at points, I think what it sets out to do is a great example of why you don't need big budget resources and in-your-face virtues to make something quality. It's all well and good to flaunt how inclusive and diverse you are in the moment, but I've often noticed that the projects that don't brag about such are the ones that make the biggest lasting impact. And now, The Henry Movie. This was written and directed by Mr. Ryan, and wow. Wow is it a ride. Going into this, I was very hesitant on what to expect. Not only because the last big fan movie I watched was, well, for lack of a better term, all bark and very little bite, but because I was so worried that this story was just going to follow Henry's perspective from when he arrived on Sodor all the way up to his crash with the Flying Kipper. And I am so, so thankful to say that no, this is not the case. In fact, this movie is top to bottom original content with very little taken from the Railway series. Henry's earliest days are super interesting to me, as he's famously the engine with a super high potential, but woefully poor performance history, due in part to the fact that he's a whacked out one-off design. From the start, you know he's been dealt a bad hand, and the movie uses that knowledge to not only make Henry super sympathetic, but also to subvert our expectations when the going gets tough. There are so many moments in this movie where I was surprised by how capable Henry was in spite of his handicapped design, and his monologue at the end of the movie is incredibly satisfying. I'm also super impressed with this movie's presentation. Live models on physical sets, with very little in the way of special effects. 
Sure, the movie relies exclusively on Tomy models, but that's hardly negative in my books. The characters blend really well with the sets, and on a visual front, everything in the world looks like it's supposed to be there. As far as writing goes, it was pretty solid. I thought Henry was a bit soft at times, but to be fair, he's only been alive for a couple months. I also liked Hurricane in this movie, even though I don't really dig his motivation. It was fine, but I would have liked a little more build up to his big revelation at the end. And finally, I don't love the climax of this movie. But for the most part, this movie had enough twists and turns to keep me engaged, not to mention some stellar cinematography and set design. And now that we've got our two nominees, it's time to announce the winner. The award for Most Ambitious goes to... Mr. Ryan. Once again, this was an incredibly close call. Like I said before, Tracks to Big Adventures is an amazing showcase of what Mattel's rebrand should have been. It nails the CGI style, it pays proper respect to the source material, heck, even the name is better. But the Henry movie just narrowly squeaked by, thanks to its superb presentation and completely original story. Rewriting an entire series to make it less shit isn't something I'd wish upon my worst enemy. But building all of these sets by hand is an undertaking that makes me want to void my bowels and move to Malaysia. In saying that, both of these projects are incredible and most certainly worth your time. Congratulations, Mr. Ryan. Our final wildcard category may not seem as impressive as the other two, but is by far one of the biggest cornerstones to being successful on a platform like YouTube. Let's take a look at who is most consistent throughout the year. I don't think people really value how important consistency is to the audience. A one-hit wonder is great in the moment, but real success in any creative profession takes more than one good piece of work. Having a consistent level of quality builds trust with your viewer. It tells them that when you make something new, it's safe for them to dedicate their time to watch it. And in the realm of the Thomas fandom, consistency is a... fickle thing. There are plenty of creators, myself included, who have made the right thing at the right time and then never quite hit that same high again. Whether that be views, or the quality of the work, or something else altogether. And so for this category, a few choice names stuck out amongst the crowd. The first was Wildmore Wester, who's been cranking out videos for his series since two fuck, 2011? Man, has time flown by. I've been vaguely aware of his series for a while, but I've never sat down to watch the entire thing. And while I do plan on going in-depth on Sodor The Early Years and its sequel, looking at where the series is now, it's good, but it doesn't quite check the right boxes for me. Again, it comes down to presentation. Some clumsy dialogue, vocal deliveries, and peaked audio keep this from being a home run in my mind. Certainly not a bad series by any means, but it just doesn't top the competition. The next name I saw fairly frequently was Stepney Productions, and yeah, they're pretty really good at what they do. I mean, look at these models and tell me they don't belong on the inevitable re-re-re-re-re-reboot of the show. His work is great, and it always looks great. But there was one nominee who edged out on top. Well, more like nominees. The winners for Most Consistent of 2022 is... Carson's Video Workshop. I think we can all agree that the people at Carson's Video Workshop are incredibly good at what they do. With a roster consisting of The Buried Truck, Light and Coal, DCG-12B, The Chair Lord, Super Gunzilla, Rigeronin, Sodor Rymodeler, Explosive Cookie, Skarloey123, Carson himself, and many, many more, this is a team that has managed to recreate the original model series style unbelievably well, telling stories that wouldn't feel out of place in the latter half of the classic series, putting new spins on long-forgotten characters, and showing us brand new ones. They're they're probably the closest we'll ever come to seeing a resurgence of the Thomas Creator Collective. And if I'm being honest, they've more than outdone the already spectacular work done by that group so many years ago. It certainly helps that they have a few veterans from that original lineup, but I digress. They are consistently a crowd pleaser that has the potential to rival anything Mattel can do, with the only big flaw in their production being that they don't have a super strong presence outside of YouTube. But that, like many things, is a topic for another video. As for now, it gives me great pleasure to award them the title of Most Consistent Creators of 2022. Unfortunately, Carson wasn't able to record an acceptance speech for this video, but he did give me something to read on his behalf. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this show. I'd like to give a huge thanks to the guys in the video workshop who helped me make this possible. I wouldn't be able to do it without them, so I can't take all the credit. Mike, Xavier, 
David, Ryan Hagen and Ryan Sock, Duncan, Jake Ernie, Andrew, Stefan, Riley. There's so many people to list off, we'd be here for a long time. I love you guys so much, and I'm thrilled and honored to be given the chance to work with you guys every day. Much love, Carson. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now then, let's move on to the penultimate category, most growth. This category can be interpreted a few different ways, and depending on how you look at it, the answer changes dramatically. First, there's the obvious interpretation, metrics. The numbers on YouTube that tell you how good your video or channel is doing. These can be subscribers, views, likes, comments, and are usually a useful judge on how good a video is before you actually watch it. And if you don't believe me, take a look at the backlash YouTube got when they decided to remove the dislike counter. Not the dislike button, just the counter. The point is that people love numbers, and in a perfect world, the video with the bigger numbers would obviously be the better video. Oh, if only that were true. It's almost comical how vapid some content on YouTube is, despite having a frustratingly high view count. Of course, I'm not saying that they don't deserve that attention, but, like, could you share some pie with the rest of us? Jokes aside, obviously numbers aren't going to cut it this time around. No, for this, we're gonna have to quantify how much a channel has improved since its launch, which is a tad trickier. I mean, how do you definitively say who improved the most? Well, let's think about it like this. Take a look at the first batch of videos they ever made, then take a look at the most recent additions to their channel, and ask yourself, if they had access to the same tools they do now, could they have made something like this back when they were first starting out? Using this as a baseline, I was able to generally nail down who had made the most improvement over the course of their channel's lifetime. And while I knew fairly early on who our frontrunner would end up being, there were a few noteworthy contenders that made this a race. To start, let's take a look at T1E2H3. Since I've covered his work a couple times already, I'll try to keep this fairly brief. T1E2H3 has been a channel that I've kept up with for a long time now. I jumped into his series at the Caledonian Bridge of Doom, and have been along for the ride ever since. These videos were some of my first exposures to Thomas fan stories that weren't just memes or crazy antics. No, these were real stories that, for the time, helped fill in the roughly 10 year gap where I didn't care about what the official show was doing, and didn't have access to the classic series. While the Engines of Sodor started out as a comedy series, it slowly evolved into a flawed but still very entertaining set of stories. And while I don't think his style has changed too much since the first batch of episodes, I can certainly see an improvement across the board. The other nomination that really made this a race was Useful Engine 11, who I was a lot less familiar with before this video. He's a modeler who dabbles mostly in the wooden railway range, and has made some very impressive pieces over the years. Seriously, his craftsmanship with some of these is stellar, and the fact that he's able to do so much with these tiny toys is crazy cool to me. And then, we come to our award winner. The one who not only grew the most from when they started, but did it with aplomb, positivity, and a practical prowess that set the standard for filmmakers in this community. The award for most growth goes to... Enterprising Engine. Enterprising Engine has always been this odd constant for me in the fandom. I'll say right now that I have not watched his content as religiously as some others in this video. I haven't kept up with his work since the very beginning, and because of that, I don't have a particular nostalgia for his series of the same name. However, he has always, always found his way into other people's work. He's played Edward and Bertram in the Engines of Sodor, he's voiced multiple characters from the Thomas Creator Collective, providing one of my favorite takes on Percy ever, he's done the narration for How in the Lost Engine, Wilfred Whistles, the list goes on. The point is, he's done a lot, all the while improving his narration, presentation, set design, writing, pretty much everything that goes into filmmaking. All while also being a genuinely nice guy. I could make an entire video just talking about his escapades alone, so instead I'll say congratulations and hand things over to the man himself. Take it away, my guy. Hello everyone, I'm Matt, aka Enterprising Engine 93 Thank you so much for nominating me in the category of Most Growth. I started filming my videos in my basement and on a bedsheet in my bedroom, and now I film my videos mostly outdoors in ways I didn't even think were possible. I would not have gotten to where I am today without all of the love and support that I have received over the years. And for those just starting out or deep in the creative process, I hope that it gives you joy where it counts, 
no matter how cruel, unforgiving, or desolate it can get. I wish you nothing but the best in all things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Before we get to our final category, I want to take a few moments to go over some legacy honorable mentions. These are people who didn't make the submission list either because they've left YouTube to do other things, or just haven't made anything as of recent. This category doesn't come with any fancy awards or anything. Rather, it's a celebration of creators from times gone by. First on the list, Joey Turner. This guy was one of the very first Thomas creators I watched back in the day. And though his style of humor doesn't do it for me anymore, damn was his Tommy Thomas and Friends series fun to follow back in the day. He's still making stuff on YouTube today, and is actually quite talented, so I highly recommend giving him a look. In the same vein, the next creator I wanted to talk about is Ms. Oliver and Blossom. His content falls into the same wacky, cartoony antics as Joey Turner, but with Bachman models instead of Tomy stuff. I remember really liking his stuff as a fun alternative to Tomy Thomas and Friends. And while once again it hasn't aged too well, when I went back to watch some of it for this video, I couldn't hate it. It was crude and corny, but it's still fun. I'm not sure what he's doing nowadays, but if he does see this, I wish him all the best. TB7 Productions, aka the guy who made Thomas and the Ghost Rider, is another big one from the early days of YouTube. He's still making content, by the way, which I think is really cool. Speaking of evil Thomas, I have to mention Thomas Blows His Stack by Bulgy13. Have you ever wondered what would happen if Thomas just said, fuck it? Well, this video answers that question and then some. If you somehow haven't seen it before, I totally recommend it. It's the bomb. For those who remember Captain Punjab, his entire series is still available on YouTube, including the Prison Break episode that I might just have to throw into a who did it better if I ever tackle Journey Beyond Sodor, just for the novelty of it. Leo Kim Video also deserves a shout out for his Mad Bomber videos way back when. His behind the scenes videos are a perfect step by step guide on how to get started filmmaking, and the original episode still holds up really well today. The Scotsman Returns is another amazing channel with loads of content that still makes me chuckle. I think The Little Westerner is one of the biggest bait and switches of a movie I've ever seen when it comes to Thomas, and its ending is just wonderful. And while we're on the subject of great filmmakers, Scarloy123, the maker of Sodor Dark Times, is another winner in my book. Seriously, how did nobody nominate this guy? He's great. And finally, Crazy Caboose Creations. Rest in peace, Peter. And now, it's time for the final category. Best in Show. This is an award dedicated to the best of what the fandom has to offer. Someone who's in a league all their own, and pushes others like myself to do something great. He's probably someone you've been screaming at me in the comments to talk about for a while now, and for damn good reason. The winner for Best in Show goes to... The Unlucky Tug. There are a plethora of reasons for why Nick deserves this award, and it's honestly a little overwhelming deciding on where to begin. The Unlucky Tug does a lot for the creative side of this fandom. While I'm sure videos talking about Thomas existed long before he made his big return, He's the person who really got the ball rolling when it came to video essays. Like most things on the internet, he provided the idea, and everyone took it and did something with it. People like Luke, Trainboy, Scrapyard Studios, and many, many more have all taken some inspiration from the MTAC series. A handful of videos meant to show that Thomas and Friends ain't just a show for children. However, this short series alone is, in my opinion, the least interesting his content has to offer. That's not to say I don't enjoy them, because I absolutely do, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. In 2021, he started getting way more experimental with his videos. Tugs trains the model series map. Fuck, this dude made three separate timeline videos explaining Thomas's three major series. And it didn't stop there. As time went on, his videos got way longer, way more in depth and in some ways would actually build off of one another. Like how the map he made for the model series is used to elevate the timeline video, or how the timeline videos themselves give context to Sodor's finest. Thomas Debunked is another fun series of his, where he sporadically drops little bits of Thomas trivia, from theories to misconceptions about the series. Sure, they're not as long and or complex as his other videos, but as someone who likes mildly interesting trivia, binging a bunch of these back to back is great. And then there's the documentaries. Oh, the documentaries. As you probably know, I love a good underdog story. And his videos on Flying Scotsman's USA Tour and Ebby's Voyage are not stories I thought I needed to hear, but I am so glad that I have. 
Seriously, how has nobody made a movie or something about Scotsman's tour of the states? It's begging to happen. Oh shit. There is an impressive amount of content here for one person, and each video goes that extra step to make them stand out. Sure, a collection video is cool, but a collection video where each character gets a short talking point is way more interesting. And clearly, I'm not the only one who thinks this, as many other YouTubers have taken these ideas and put their own spin on them. And while we're talking about his videos, dang does he go in depth. There's a reason some of his videos are feature length, because you know you're gonna hear what he thinks about every aspect of what he's looking at. Which can admittedly be both a blessing and a curse in some respect. I'm by no means saying that long videos are bad, in fact I think long videos can be super fulfilling to complete. And it's not like his videos don't warrant the longer runtime, it's just that some of them can be a bit too analytical. A perfect example of this is the Cars review, where he goes on and on and on about incredibly little details that don't really matter in the overall movies. Like how there's a Pope mobile or how cars go to the shitter. It's by no means a deal breaker, and he does make these more analytical moments engaging, but I've often found that long videos take more of a commitment to watch than shorter ones if you don't keep the pace moving. However, in Nick's case, he most certainly can keep things moving, and get a laugh out of me while doing it. And if you can keep me engaged while talking about cars for over an hour, then you must be doing something right. There's a reason everyone stops and stares when he puts out a big video, because he really does care about what he makes. And not only does he manage to do all that, but he's also given back to the fandom in some pretty notable ways. Not only with ideas for models to make, or new horizons for videos, but tangible stuff as well. Without his scans of the Railway series illustrations, I would not be able to make my videos the way that I do, nor would a lot of people without compromising on quality. I cannot stress enough how incredibly competent the Unlucky Tug is at what he does. He has stepped up his game to a level that few people can keep up with, and for that, I can think of no better person to take the title of Best in Show. Congratulations. I cannot thank you enough for sticking around to watch this video. This whole awards show wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for everyone's amazing contributions. Not only in the turnout for submissions, but in the material itself, and the generous people who helped get the word out with their own videos and posts. Heck, I even got a few memes sent my way, which was genuinely funny, I really like those. If I can break script for a moment, I just want to say how much this fandom means to me. It is incredible that all these creators from all walks of life, who make some of the best media I've ever seen, have come together over this funny little blue train and all his friends. It's people like you who make this video, no, this fandom, what it is. Whether it's making models, composing music, or just sharing a laugh. This is one community that I will never, ever tire of seeing pour their heart and soul into what they do. Sure, we might never get a resurgence of the show we all know and love. And for some, the fun of making content like this might end one day. But right now, in this moment, I am proud beyond belief to say that I am part of a community that has not only pushed me to be the best I can be, but continues to inspire others, and in some cases help them find their way. Thank you so much for making all of this come together. I hope we can do it again someday. Yeah.